Hi everyone, we're back in chapter six, skincare products, chemistry, ingredients, and selection. And in this section, 6-4, we're gonna describe the main types of ingredients in cosmetic um, chemistry, but this is a really long section, so I've divided it in two parts. Uh, part one will end at exfoliation. Part two picks up on lighteners and brighteners. So um, we're gonna get started in part one. So every ingredient used in our cosmetic chemistry does have a purpose in their finished products. And they've divided them into two main parts, functional ingredients and performance ingredients. So first off, we're gonna talk about the functional ingredients. And those are the ones that do not affect the appearance of your skin, but they're very necessary in the product formulation. They can act as a vehicle, which means they allow products to spread, they give them um, body and texture, and they also give products a specific form, like a lotion, a cream, or a gel. So let's take a look at this chart on different functional ingredients here. We'll start with water. Um, water is, we're gonna look at the ingredient, so it's water, and then we go to the type, vehicle or a solvent. An example would be water. So now let's look at emollients. So emollients are oils, fatty acids, fatty alcohols, fatty esters, and silicones. So um, an example of this would be like jojoba oil, olive oil, um, and sesame oil and mineral oil. So the next one down is surfactants. And you wanna know these, they have been on the boards. There's two surfactants, detergents and emulsifiers. So memorize that. Um, examples, ammonium, laurel, uh, laureth, sorry, sulfate, uh, coca amino propyl biotine, and then disodium laurel sulfosuconate, and then there's uh, sodium laureth, sulfate, sodium laurel sulfate. So those are examples of that. And then delivery systems, we have vehicles, liposomes and polymers. Examples, emollients, water, phospholipids, um, and micro sponges. And we're gonna talk more about those later as we get into this chapter. Okay, and then preservatives. Preservatives are antimicrobial antioxidant and uh, chelating agents. And one example would be urea, parabens, quaternarium 15, phenoxyethanol, citric acid, and disodium EDTA. Okay, so the next one is fragrance. Okay, fragrances um, are natural and there's also synthetic. And synthetic perfumes, plant essential oils is what they use, and then color agents. You want to know these as well. These have been on boards. Uh, certified example, or certified exempt and lakes. Uh, DNC organic, zinc oxide, okay, um, mica, mineral dyes, metal salts, inorganic, like iron oxide would be an example. And then thickeners, Okay, so thickeners are lipids, emulsifiers, polymers, uh, minerals, and synthetic. Okay, so examples, carbomers, gel, gelatin, silica, uh, sterile alcohol, and then there's xanthan gum. So those are some uh, types of thickeners. Now we're going to look at the pH adjusters. They're called buffers. And examples would be citric acid, sodium bicarbonate. Also, they use like lactic acid and other things. And what they use those for is if a product is at a 10 on the pH scale, which would be very alkaline, then they're going to add citric acid to bring the pH back to a safe level. They kind of want to keep that at a 5.5 to a 5. So what if the product is at a one on the pH scale, then they're gonna add sodium bicarbonate and bring that pH level up to a five or a 5.5. 5. 
Okay, and lastly, solvents. So solvents are alcohol and water. Uh, isopropyl alcohol and butylene glycol would be some examples of that. So now we're gonna talk more about the performance ingredients. Those are the ones that cause the actual changes in the appearance of the skin. Examples would include ingredients like moisturizers, exfoliates, um, or things that moisturize, exfoliate the skin, or smooth the skin surface. So as you can see in the name, they are actually causing a change in the appearance of the skin. Performance ingredients, sometimes they refer to them as active agents, um, but or they're also called active ingredients. Active ingredients, though so that's an official term for used in the drug industry to indicate ingredients that chemically cause physiological changes. Um, but one thing, sunscreen is a drug, uh, some of the ingredients, and so it that's why when you're looking on a bottle of sunscreen, you'll see the active ingredients first and then you'll see the functional second. And usually the active ingredients would be like octal salicylate or things like that. Okay, um, so some ingredients, they do serve multiple roles in a product and they can act as either both a functional and a performance at the same time. Okay, so um, what are the main types of ingredients in our product formulations? Well, the main types used in our product formulations, that does include a combination of both functional and performance. So here's some types that we're going to cover. And we're going to start with water, and then we'll go through emollients, surfactants, delivery systems, preservatives, fragrances, color agents, gelants and thickeners, pH adjusters, and solvents. And then once we're finished covering those, we'll go into botanicals and then ingredients for exfoliation. So let's talk about water first. So water here is both a functional and a performance ingredient. So as a functional ingredient, what it does is it keeps other ingredients in the solution mixed in there and it acts as a vehicle to spread products across the skin. So that's how it's a functional. But as a performance ingredient, water replenishes moisture on the surface of the skin. So I think if skin cells are like dry and dehydrated, um, just think of it this way, they would be like a raisin. But then once you add water, this is where the performance comes in. It plumps it back up to like a grape. So think of it that way. Um, did you know that products that don't contain any water, those are called anhydros. An means no, not, or lack of. Hydros means water. So no water. Um, these include oil-based serums, silicone serums, petrolatum-based products like lip balms. Um, in addition, aloe vera, that is also used instead of water as a vehicle in product formulations. The only problem that I've um, ever found with that is if somebody's allergic to aloe vera, and if that's your main thing, then it's really hard to find products that don't contain that for clients that have aloe vera um, allergies. All right, so the next thing we're gonna go through is emollients. These are also both functional and performance. So as a functional, emollients, they help place, spread, and keep other substances on the skin. But as a performance ingredient, they lubricate the skin surface and they put up a little guard, a barrier guard. So um, it'll be like a guard on the skin, okay, to uh, trap in the water. So emollients formulated in your products, that's one of the most common uh, performance ingredients. So they are made up of lipids, which are substances like a fat, a oil, or a wax. Now some come in natural sources and others are synthesized in a lab 
or they're derived from other oils and fatty materials. Um, what they do is, like I said, they lay on top of the skin and they prevent dehydration by trapping that water in the skin and decreasing transepidermal water loss. So emollients may be rich or light in consistency. If it's they're made for dry skin, um, then they're going to be heavier. So dry skin, as we know, it doesn't produce enough sebum and it does need those heavier emollient ingredients. But if their skin is oily or problematic, then that skin is going to benefit from a really very light weight or light in consistency emollient. So what emollients do, again, is like I said, they sit on top of the skin and they really do trap in the um, moisture. And that process is called occlusion. Okay, so let me move this up. So let's talk about the types of emollients. Um, oils, those are formulated into cosmetics and they do vary in their density, their fat content and their heaviness from very light to uh, extremely rich and heavy. Now, oils can be beneficial to all skin types if they're properly um, selected. Oils do come from different sources and two of the most main ones are from um, mineral sources. Um, so those are oils from the earth and they're formulated in their cosmetics um, and they come from highly refined and purified uh, petroleum sources is where they get that. And these emollients are time tested. They do offer excellent protection against dehydration and they prevent skin contact with the irritants. Um, they are completely non-reactive and they are biologically inert, which means they do not react with other chemicals involved in your skin's function. And they can be used with no preservatives because they don't harbor bacteria or other organisms. So let's look at some examples of that. And that would be liquid paraffins, uh, emollient ingredients derived from petroleum sources, and another one is mineral oil and another petrolatum, so like Vaseline. So mineral oil and Vaseline for a long time, especially mineral oil, it was rumored to be um, unsafe and so they didn't like to use it in a lot of products and this was in the early 80s and so they leave it out of products due to that a lot of people were um, afraid of it but guys honestly they are super good um, for your skin and like i said they are inert so they don't react with the chemicals in your skin so say for instance a person has extremely dry skin Let's say uh, their hands are really chapped and they have a lot of fissures, those are cracks in the skin. Um, if you put a lotion that contains, say, fragrance in there, it's gonna cause a lot of burning and stinging, but if you, due to the chemical reactions, but if you put Vaseline on there, then um, there is no, it's inert, so there is no reaction, there's no burning or anything. Personally, I love that for the occlusive nature of Vaseline as well. Um, anyway, so it's a very, they are very safe and they're very effective. Um, botanical oils, those are dozens of plant oils that we use in skincare products. A lot of them vary in their fatty acid content and their heaviness. Um, one of them is coconut oil and palm. Those are two of the fattiest and heaviest oils. And they're very saturated fats. And I got my um, book here and I was going to show you in red. And notice these are saturated fats. And notice the top, the very top one is coconut oil. And look how long the red um, bar goes. So it shows you it's the most saturated and heaviest um, oil that there is. And they're very, and there's a big debate on 
how healthy that is for your body or not. So there's a group that says it isn't and there's a group that says it is. But on skincare, it's totally fine. Okay, so there's a lot of less light and less comedogenic plant oils that we use too. Argan oil, hemp seed oil, those are highly beneficial to oily and problematic skin due to the lightness, they're not so heavy. Um, so did you guys know that botanical oils vary in their fatty acid content and their heaviness? So a lot of estheticians refer to comedogenic ratings to guide them through selecting their botanical oils for certain skin types. Now there's a few rating scales available that you can go to on the internet, but all of them might uh, differ a little bit slightly due to how updated they are. Um, so we do have a table here that we're gonna look at. Okay, so um, zero means it will not clog the pores. And then one means it's very low in comedogenicity. Two is moderately. And then three is um, moderate. And then four, uh, let's see, four is uh, fairly high. And then five is high. Okay, so, and then there's just, go through it and look at it. Like almond oil is rated at a two, coconut oil at a four, linseed oil at a four, rosehip oil at a one. So kind of go through this and look at the different um, ratings on this, on the comedogenicity scale of this. Um, so now we're gonna talk about another type in, of emollient, and that is silicone. Now, you need to know about silicones because um, I will tell you they are on your state board exam, so you do need to know those. Um, but what are silicones? They're just groups of oils that are chemically combined with silicon and oxygen, and they leave a non-comedogenic protective film on the skin. They act as a vehicle by spreading some products, and they're excellent protectants helping to keep moisture trapped in the skin. But here's the cool thing. They allow oxygen molecules to go in and out of the follicles. So that's why they're very non-comedogenic because remember, oxygen kills the bacteria that causes or perpetuates uh, um, acne. So oxygen is a good thing, when, especially for clients that have breakout prone skin. Uh, silicones add that silky, non-greasy feel to your products, and we use them a lot in sunscreens, foundations, and moisturizers. So let's talk about a few of these um, silicone examples. And then cyclopentasiloxane. Um, that one is um, different. It doesn't end in cone, but I was gonna say a key word that you always want to look for is see if they end in cone, like dimethicone. That one ends in cone. And then phenyl trimethicone, so, or phenyl, sorry, phenyl trimethicone. Um, those ones end in cone, so those are kind of easy to know, um, but the other one is a little bit different. So, but normally when you see them end in cone, you know it's a silicone. Okay, fatty acid lubricants. Um, fatty acid ingredients, those are derived from plant oils and also from animal oils. And although these ingredients are acids, they're not irritating and they're actually more like an oil, okay? Um, some examples of this would be um, caprylic acid, um, or caprylic, sorry, I don't know, I'm tired. Caprylic acid, oleic acid, stearic acid, those are examples of that. Um, so now we're gonna talk about fatty alcohols. So fatty alcohols, they have a wax-like consistency, um, and they are used as emollients or spreading agents. So you wanna know the difference of those two. Um, and then 
fatty alcohols, they were made by uh, taking a fatty acid and they saturate it with hydrogen and it ends up making a fatty alcohol. Okay, so fatty alcohols again have that wax-like consistency. Fatty acids have an oil-like consistency. What's some examples of fatty alcohols? Uh, well, they're acetyl alcohol, lauryl alcohol, and stearyl alcohol. And notice um, what they end in. They end in alcohol, and then the acids ended in acid. Now, a fatty ester, it's a combination of combining both an alcohol and an acid together, and you end up with what we call an ester. Okay, so esters are easily recognized on labels. Why? Because they almost always end in A-T-E. Not all of them, but most of them do. So eight. Um, they often feel better than natural oils, and they lubricate way more evenly. So some examples of those would be, let me see if I can get this to move, um, glycerol, stearate, isopropyl, myristate, um, and then octyl palmitate. Okay, um, surfactants, again, like I was telling you, um, you want to remember these. So there's two types, and that is detergents and emulsifiers. So um, surfactants, what they do is they reduce the tension between the skin and the product, and they increase the ability of the cosmetic products to spread. They act as cleansing agents, foaming agents, and emulsifiers to create a stable mixture of oil and water. So, um, I just remember this on surfactants. Surfactants have um, the more foam in your product, the more surfactant because they do cause uh, products to foam. So, that's one way you can remember it. And the more foam, the more surfactants in there. Okay, surfactants they work by um, becoming infused in both water and oil mixtures. So I'm going to show you what a surfactant molecule it has a hydrophilic head and a lipophilic tail. So that's what a surfactant molecule looks like. And they keep the water and the oil mixed. So the hydrophilic head binds with the water part and the lipophilic tail binds with the oil part. Um, surfactants do play a lot of roles in cosmetic formulations and some of, some of the most versatile um, ingredients in your skincare. So types of surfactants, detergent is the main type, okay? And it's primarily used for your cleansing products. Um, they are the agents that cause the cleansers to foam and they remove oil, dirt, makeup, and debris from the skin surface. And they're more gentle detergents and they can be derived from natural sources like coconut. Okay, so um, detergents, what they do is they redu reduce the surface tension of dirt and oil by lifting them off of the skin. Okay, so some examples, ammonium lauryl sulfate and then um, coca amidopropyl biotine, uh, disodium lauryl sulfasuconate, and then sodium laureth sulfate and sodium laurel sulfate. So emulsifiers, what they do is um, the other part of it. So um, with surfactants, you wanna remember detergents, I think D and E. Okay, detergents and emulsifiers. So what the emulsifiers do is they cause that oil and water to mix, like I was showing you here, with the aid of a surfactant a molecule. And so without emulsifiers in there, the oil and water would separate into two layers. So emulsifiers, what they do is they surround the oil particles, allowing them to remain evenly distributed, uh, distributed sorry, throughout the water. 
Okay, so an emulsion or emulsifier is added to the water and oil process. So there's two types of emulsifiers, and there is oil, and you always want to remember it this way. This line means in water, okay, and this is going to have the most in the product. And so if we have a little beaker here of mostly water, okay, and then you're going to have little droplets of oil. Okay, now these tails will attract to the oil, and the heads will be outside towards the water, okay? And then the other one is um, water in oil. So it means it's mostly oil, okay, with little droplets of, of water in the thing. And so what happens is this hydrophilic head will go and surround with the tails pointing out towards the oil. Okay, so that's how those work to keep them mixed together. Um, so anyway, so when you think of these two, the water in um, oil, I mean oil in the water, sorry, and then the water in the oil, these are going to be more lightweight. These are going to be like your... Um, Oh, like, you know, when we have our massage lotion and our massage cream, so these are going to be more like the massage lotion. And then these are going to be heavier because of the oil concentration. So it would be like night creams, um, moisturizers, really rich ones like that. And I think of our massage cream in this one. Okay, so uh, again, like these are going to be uh, lotion and uh, serums and then these are heavy creams okay so some examples are polysorbate potassium acetyl sulfate and then um, uh, uh, ceteral ceteral alcohol couldn't remember the other name anyway so those are our um, surfactants now let's go through our delivery systems and talk about those. And those are mainly functional ingredients, okay? So our skin's job is to protect our body from outside irritants, so it is designed to keep everything out, including skincare ingredients. But how are those ingredients delivered in the skin? That's really important um, to to get those products in there. Otherwise, they just sit on the surface and they don't really do a whole lot other than maybe block transepidermal water loss. So what we did, what they discovered is if they use a delivery system, then what they can do is they can use that to distribute a product's key performance ingredients deeper into the skin when it's applied. So that's what those are. And um, let's talk about types of delivery systems. So vehicles, those are the ones that are carrying bases and they spread the agents necessary for the formulation of your cosmetics. And vehicles carry or deliver other ingredients into the skin and they make it more effective. And some examples would be emollients, silicones, and water. Now, one example of a um, delivery system is a liposome, and I'm going to show you here, I have a picture of a liposome. Okay, so they're microscopic, hollow, fluid-like spheres. Um, they're little bubbles, so uh, lipo means fat, and some means sphere. So they're little, um, little small balls and they have performance ingredients inside of here okay and so they're encapsulated with this bilayer um, structure and what it does is it mimics your cell membranes and it allows for easy penetration beyond the stratum corneum so liposomes they bring those key ingredients to a targeted depth of the skin and they slowly release them Okay, so you notice here we have a hydrophilic um, head, and then they say hydrophobic tails, but these are, um, they don't like water. 
but we have two hydrophilic, and this is like a lipophilic, so it's more fat-like here. And so, um, so one liposome could contain um, a lot of lipid layers within it, could be filled with multiple functional ingredients in here, and they also protect the quality and the integrity of your performance ingredients that are inside of here. A uh, liposome itself is made up of several ingredients and phospholipids you would notice on the label. Also, sphingolipids would be, or ceramides, would be another name. Liposomes, they can encapsulate and transport water-soluble ingredients in their polar cavity and their um, oil-soluble ingredients in their hydrophobic cavity. So again, this is the outside, which is hydrophilic, and this is hydrophobic. Okay, so another type of delivery system is polymers, and they're chemical compounds, and they're formed by a number of small molecules. One of one used, um, one use, sorry, can't talk, of the polymers is in the delivery systems. Um, they are used as advanced vehicles, and what they do is they release ingredients onto the skin surface at a microscopically controlled rate. So some examples of this would be hydrogels and micro sponges. Um, so I think of, when I think of them, I think of like um, time release medications. So you know how they'll be active for say 12 hours or whatever? That's kind of what those are like. So they release small amounts um, of whatever's inside of there at microscopically controlled rates. So they're pretty cool. Like when they first started, um, designing them they wanted to see if they could put retinol which is really strong into the skin without causing any sensitivities so that's when they discovered the micro sponges um all right preservatives is our other one that we're going to talk about and those are functional ingredients preservatives what they do is they prevent bacteria fungi molds and other microorganisms from living in your products and they extend the shelf life of your product and they offer pro uh, protection from chemical changes that can adversely affect the product. Now, most products contain a blend of preservatives to cover the range of bacteria, fungi, and so on that might be encountered. So there's uh, types of preservatives that we're gonna talk about. And there's the traditional ones. And those, are, those include your formaldehyde releasing and parabens. Um, a formaldehyde releasing one is just a chemical that it's a chemical compound and what it does is it slowly releases formaldehyde, which is an antimicrobial chemical on into the product. And as it decomposes in that, um, what am I trying to say? It kills bacteria is what I'm trying to say. Um, some of these chemical preservatives, they do remain controversial because of the po po potential irritancy, and sometimes it does cause health issues um, for people. So, and you can do your own research on that, guys. Um, I won't go into it, but there is a lot of research that's being put out there on the cons health concerns of them. Uh, cosmetic regulatory organizations around the world, they do suggest that parabens, especially in small amounts in your cosmetics, do not pose a significant health risk. And then there's others that feel like, yeah, they do. They may be a reason for concern. So again, like I was telling you, just go ahead and do your own research on that. So what's some examples of them? Uh, butyl paraben, methyl parabens. Now, methyl parabens are most frequently used preservatives because of their low sensitizing potential. And um, what they do is, like I said, um, they combat bacteria, molds, 
and they are non-comedogenic. So um, another one is your propylparaben, okay, and imidazole, lignol, urea, diazole, lignol, urea, and quaternarium 15. Um, so quaternarium 15, it's an all-purpose preservative. Again, active against bacteria, molds, yeast, and it's probably gonna be the greatest formaldehyde releasing agent among all your cosmetic preservatives. And that one can and has caused certain dermatitis reactions and allergies in a lot of people. Okay, and then there's the organic acids and natural alternatives. Uh, those are avail available for use as preservatives. You'll find them combined together in a product to provide a wide range of protection from the growth of bacteria and fungi. Some examples, phenoxyethanol, sodium benzoate, uh, potassium sorbate, um, there's benzyl alcohol and benzoic acid and sorbic acid. And a lot of those is due to, on the chemistry of those, the benzene ring. It causes a lot of irritation in a lot of people, um, any of those. So antioxidants, we do use those as preservatives as well. Um, what they do is they extend the shelf life of your product and they reduce the rate of oxidation in your formulations. So what is oxidation? Well, that's a chemical process that occurs when oils and other, other natural ingredients are exposed to oxygen and it causes them to start to degrade. Okay, so um, that's where free radicals start from that um, oxidation. So it's um, a loss of electrons. All right, so what are some examples of antioxidants that we would see in our skincare products? Um, one is BHA. It's a synthetic uh, formulated um, product and it stands for butylated hydroxyanisole. And then BHT is another synthetic one and it stands for butylated hydroxytoline and then citric acid. All right, chelating agents. Um, chelating agents are added to our products. Um, we're still in preservatives, okay. So they're added to our products to boost the efficacy of our preservatives. Um, they're not a preservative in their own right, but their crucial role is in the stability and the quality of your skincare products. Chelating agents, what they do is they break down the cell wall of bacteria and other microorganisms. Um, so, and then that allows the preservative to be more effective for a much longer time. So what are some examples of those? Uh, disodium EDTA, uh, tetrasodium EDTA, trisodium uh, EDTA. Okay, so now we're in fragrances. Okay, so fragrances are a functional ingredient and we can add those to um, our mask formulation especially if it has unpleasant natural smell when you mix the products, then they're gonna add that in there. Um, they neutralize the smell or improve the consumer's experience and use of the product. Okay, so there's different types of fragrance that we use, synthetic and natural. Now the synthetic, those are created by combining chemical ingredients in a lab and they can consist of as many as 200 ingredients. And there's no way to know what the, all those chemicals are, but they just, on the label, when you're looking, it'll just say fragrance on there. Okay, natural fragrances. Those are botanicals, and they're comp they do comprise the basic elements of your natural scents in the skincare product formulation. Um, there's countless extracts, individual scents to choose from, um, but we're gonna start and talk about the essential oils. So those are highly concentrated plant oils and they're used in their natural aromas and they're 
uh, referred to as fragrant soul of the plant is what they refer to them as. A lot of manufacturers, they formulate products with specific essential oils to provide the benefit of aromatherapy in addition to giving the product a pleasant smell. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about aromatherapy. So it is, aromatherapy is derived from the ancient practice of using natural plant extracts to promote, or essence, or I should say the plant essence, um, to promote the health and the well-being. It does consist of the use of pure essential oils obtained from a wide assortment of plants and herbs. Um, and what they do is you'll either steam distill them or cold press uh, distill those um, essential oils from the plant and they'll uh, take it from the flowers, the, the fruit, the bark, or the root. Um, I remember when I was in um, organic chemistry, we did the steam um, extract. So we, I did clove. And so I took cloves and I ground them up and then um, I extracted the essential oil from them. Okay, so essential, essential oils, they're very concentrated plant oils. And again, we use them for our natural aromas. Okay, so what is aromatherapy? It's the practice of that um, aromatherapy when essential oils are inhaled through the nose or um, uh, molecules are carried through the lining of your nasal ca cavity. Um, that's called the olfactory um, nerves. And you have two of them and they sit right up on top of the nose this way, right back in, in your head. Um, they, the olfactory bulbs, they're really, really large. Um, anyway, they're located, like I said, at the roof of the inner nose. And these smell receptors, they do communicate with parts of your brain, and they, they are uh, storehouses for emotions and memories. And when you apply them to um, pulse points or you mix them with a carrier oil or a cream in your massage and your facial mask, then um, of course you can smell them and it stimulates that part of your brain and it um, relates to memories. So say for instance, um, I don't know, say you smell rose um, and you know, like a rose and you think of your grandma or something. Okay, so anyway, whether they're inhaled or applied topically, researchers do believe that essential oils can influence the changes in your physical, emotional, and your mental health. Okay, so I know when one of my daughters had to have surgery, and she's never had surgery before, so um, on the pillow before they put her out, they had, um, on this side, they put lavender, and on this side, they put some other essential oil, I can't remember, but they had these little things, and they'd peel back, and it had a sticky back, and then they peel off the sticky part and stick it on her pillow. And so they even use, you know, essential oils like that in medicine due to um, what it does for your emotional, your mental health, and physical health. Now for estheticians, um, if you are interested in, you know, using aromatherapy, um, you do need to check with your state board regulations first and make sure it falls within your scope of licensure. Okay, so additional training and education is also required because um, essential oils can be a volatile and they can cause adverse reactions um, like allergies, they can cause burns if you use them incorrectly. So really know what you're doing when you start using essential oils. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the next category. Here is um, color agents. Okay, and those are both functional and performance. Okay, so the purpose on the functional color agents, what they do um, in your skincare formulations is they will enhance the product's visual appeal. 
um, performance. They're found in makeup and they give your eyeshadow, your foundation, your lipstick. Um, they do change the appearance to help change the appearance on the skin. Okay, color agents are added to that. Uh, color agents are substances. They can be vegetable, pigment, or mineral dyes, and they give products color. Okay, so let's talk about these uh, types of color agents. And guys, you want to know these because they have been on state boards. Uh, colors subject to certification. These color additives are subject to FDA batch certification, and they do include synthetic um, organic dyes, lakes, and pigments. Okay, they are synthesized mainly from raw materials obtained from petroleum sources. Um, these certified colors, they are listed on the ingredient label as D and C, which stands for drug and cosmetic, or F, D, and C, which is food, drug, and cosmetic. Okay, so lakes is the first one we're going to talk about. Uh, lakes are insoluble pigments, and they're made by combining a dye with an inorganic material, mostly like metal salts, and um, we use them for our really colorful cosmetics. Now, because lakes are not soluble in water, they're often used when it's important to keep a color from bleeding or in a lipstick. Okay, colors exempt from certification. Those are primarily from your minerals, your plant and animal sources. Although non-certified colors are not subject to FDA batch certification requirements, they're still considered artificial colors. And when we use them in cosmetics or other FDA regulated products, they do have to comply with all the labeling requirements. Okay, so the next uh, category is thickeners. So um, thickeners right here, um, they are functional ingredients. And the purpose of these, we put them in our cosmetics to thicken or, um, you know, give it consistency. So they'll thicken the product. Or another thing, they suspend ingredients that are really hard to mix in your product. And we get them from different sources, but you can get them from lipids, emulsifiers, polymers, minerals, and synthetic ingredients. And one of them is carbomers. Carbomers are ingredients used to thicken creams. You mostly find them too a lot in your gel products. And then um, carnauba wax, and then gel gelatin and silica. Okay, and I think, oh yes. Uh, steril alcohol and xanthan gum. Okay, so the next one we're going to go into is pH adjusters. Again, those are functional ingredients only, and they're called buffering agents. And what they do is they stabilize your products and they prevent changes in the pH. Um, they're acids and alkali bases, and they adjust the pH of your product. So we use acetic acid, we also use citric acid, and sodium hydroxide, and sodium bicarbonate. Now sodium bicarbonate is baking soda, and um, so we use that as a buffering agent or a neutralizer or a, just a pH adjuster. Okay, so the last, or the next one, solvents right here, the last on this list. And those are functional ingredients. And what they are is they're added to your product formulation to help dissolve other ingredients. Examples would be alcohol. Um, they're antiseptic solvents used in perfume, lotions, and astringents. Uh, specially denatured alcohol is a mixture of ethanol with a denaturing um, agent. And then polyethylene glycol and water. Okay, now uh, let's talk about botanicals. So those are, these are performance ingredients here. Okay, and um, they've become a major source of ingredients in our skincare products and our treatments. And they do provide a lot of benefits to support the health, 
texture and integrity of the skin and that includes healing, soothing, and brightening. And a lot of botanical ingredients also provide antimicrobial and antioxidant benefits. Uh, botanical ingredients, what they originate from was plants, herbs, flowers, roots, uh, the fruit, the leaves, and the seeds of the plant. Okay, so um, the actual composition of your botanical ingredients, it depends on a lot of different factors. For example, they can be extracted from the plant by using a solvent. Uh, different parts of the plant can be processed for use like the flowers, the seeds, the roots, or even the leaves. Uh, some ingredients, those are obtained directly without extraction. Uh, the plant part might be dried or you grind it into a powder. And in other cases, the plant can be squeezed or pressed to obtain the juice or the oil from it. Now, botanicals do um, have, they, or they have become major sources in our skincare products. So, um, let's see, examples. Um, so, there is a big long list of botanical ingredients in our skincare products. Um, and so, throughout the chapter, you guys will find a lot of common botanicals in product formulations, along with their distinct benefits as we go throughout this chapter. Okay, so, um, now, the last section that we're going to talk about is ingredients for exfoliation in this part one section. And so these again are performance ingredients. Okay, so exfoliating ingredients, what they do is they provide exfoliation and that's just the removal of the dead skin cells on our skin's outer surface. So exfoliation it does make your skin appear brighter and it can clear the path for other skincare products to work more effectively. So let's look at some of the types of exfoliation. First off, we'll talk about mechanical. So that, that is also called physical because you're physically rubbing the skin with ingredients to polish away the dead skin cells from the surface of the skin. So gentle massage actions of the specific ingredient on the skin, what it does is it loosens the dead skin cells so that they can be easily sloughed off. So some examples would be beeswax, ground nuts and seeds, jojoba beads, magnesium crystals, oatmeal, and rice bran. So let's talk about the chemical ones. So the chemical agents what they do is they dissolve the dead skin cells on the surface of the skin and the intercellular matrix, the glue that holds those cells together called desmosomes. So if you look here, um, say this was a cell and here's a cell, they have these little desmosomes between the cells okay, that hold them together. And when we use the chemical, um, they dissolve these desmosomes and let these cells flake off the skin. Okay, so in addition to smoothing the skin, they also brighten the overall skin tone and they can improve conditions like acne or even hyperpigmentation. Okay, so there's different types of chemical ingredients that we use in our exfoliation. And the first one we're going to talk about is enzymes. So here I put this up for you, or printed it. Um, so enzymes, they provide gentle exfoliation, and they dissolve the keratin proteins uh, within the dead skin cells on the surface to make your skin smoother and softer. And it can help maintain the hydration level of your epidermis. Okay, so um, let's look at some examples of, of enzymes. Uh, here we have bromelain, which is from pineapple, papain, which is from papaya, and um, pumpkin, and then pancreatin, which is a beef byproduct. So if you think about that, where, 
where would you think that would come from on the beef in the pancreas? So they're extracting enzymes from there to help dissolve the skin. Now, one thing you want to remember with the enzymes is remember those dissolve the proteins, the keratin proteins. They don't break down the desmosomes like the AHAs and the BHAs. What they do is they dissolve the keratin. Okay, so let's talk about the AHAs. So um, alpha hydroxy acids, AHAs, um, those are naturally occurring acids and they're derived from fruits, nuts, milk, and sugars. Okay, today some of the AHAs may be synthetically made. They are water soluble. So remember that AHAs right here, AHAs are water soluble. Okay, and they dissolve the glue, like I was showing you here, the desmosomes that hold the skin together, the skin cells, um, and that allows those cells to slough off. They do brighten the skin, they smooth the skin, and they aid in cell turnover. So let's look at some of the um, examples of those. So citric acid from oranges and lemons, glycolic acid from sugar cane, lactic acid from milk proteins, malic acid from apples, and mandelic, um, mandelic acid from bitter almonds, and tartaric acid is from grapes. Okay, so it's really important to understand how your HA acids work on the skin, how deep they penetrate and the amount of exfoliation they provide. That depends on the molecular structure as well as the concentration of the acid in the product. And the most common AHAs found in our skincare products are glycolic acid. One thing you want to remember, glycolic has the smallest molecule. So the smallest molecular structure and it has the ability to penetrate the deepest of all of your AHAs. And for this reason, it is considered the most active AHA and highly effective to exfoliate, brighten, and smooth the skin's texture. Now, products with highly concentrations of glycolic acid, they should be used with caution, especially on really thin or sensitive skin. And the next really popular one is lactic acid. Um, it does have a larger molecule um, molecular structure, so it's more gentle and less irritating than glycolic. And in addition to exfoliating, lactic acid helps to increase the natural moisturizing factor in the epidermal lipids within our skin. So it has a lot of lightening benefits for those with discoloration. Mandelic acid, remember that one came from almonds, and it has the largest molecular structure it's really gentle, yet it's been found to be really effective in the overall skin tone and the texture, and it's helpful in treating oily and problematic skin due to the natural anti antibacterial and sebum regulating properties. All right, so let's look at um, BHAs. Okay, so beta hydroxy acids. Um, the the one, only one that we use is salicylic acid. It's the most common BHA found in our skincare products. Um, it works by dissolving the bond between the cells in the epidermis so that the dead cells can slough off. Now, the main difference is that salicylic is oil soluble, okay? Um, and it can get down into those pores and cut out, cut right through the oil that clogs up those pores. So it does have antibacterial and anti-inflammatory properties. So it's really good in treating oily and problematic skin. And certain botanicals are really high in natural salicylic acid. And they're all often used in oily and problematic skin. And some examples are meadowsweet and willow bark okay so if and one thing about these is salicylic acid um, they use it in aspirin uh, acetyl salicylate 
And so if your client has aspirin allergies, you don't want to use salicylic acid on, on them. Also, don't use meadow sweet or willow bark. So, and then the last one that we're going to talk about is retinol. Okay, so retinol is a vitamin A derivative. It's gained popularity um, in the skincare products and professional treatments because when applied, it doesn't have that immediate redness or irritation like high concentrations of your AHA can um, cause. So visibly sloughing, um, it may not occur for several days after the application. I can tell you though, when I use my retinols, I do get sloughing because it's pretty powerful depending on the product. The product line I use has pure retinol. Some of them are just a blend of retinol in the product. Now the amount of retinol in your product will vary with higher concentrations available through licensed skincare and medical professionals. Um, so anyway, you want to watch it when you're using retinols. And when you're having a client use retinol, just have them start like on Monday um, of every week. And then, or, you know, one day a week, I guess. And then do the next week, say Monday and Wednesday, until their skin gets used to it. And then you keep on going like that until you can use them nightly because they are pretty strong. Okay, guys, so that is the end of this section, part one. Um, I will have a part two starting with lighteners and brighteners.